let's stand together in the honor of the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 13. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. There are few things as important or essential in the Christian life than prayer. And yet, after nearly 20 years in ministry, the majority of Christians that I know, if you ask them how they feel about their prayer lives, very few, if any, have ever been like, it's amazing. You know, couldn't, couldn't stand to get any better than what it is. It's really maxed out. Couldn't add anything to it. I'm really crushing it. I'm surprised I don't get to wear a belt around that says prayer ninja. I've never met that person. In fact, um, the most common experience is that Christians not only feel like they're not that great at praying, but a lot of Christians live with kind of this simmering, low-level sense of guilt that's always kind of there, that they're not good enough that we don't pray very well, that we don't pray as we ought to, that we're not being as faithful as we could be, that guilt that just simmers and stays there. This is why I'm beginning this year with a three-week series on prayer. And I've entitled it, Learning How to Pray. And we're gonna study the Lord's Prayer because that's quite literally what it's about. Uh, The Lord's Prayer is a structure teaching us how it is that we're to pray. And here's what I'm hoping happens. I'm hoping what happens, I'm praying what happens, is that we get better personally at praying. And then I'm hoping that it will help us also to get better corporately at praying, praying together as a body. Now, the reason we're studying this prayer in particular is because it's literally the passage that Jesus is, you know, we have that shows Jesus teaching a master class on prayer, right? If you were to say right now, Lord, if you could show me how to pray, what you've got in Matthew 6 is his answer because that's literally what happens in Luke's gospel. In Luke's gospel, his disciples request, Lord, teach us to pray and that leads him to talk about and to unpack what we're looking at today, known as the Lord's Prayer. And so this should encourage us to say, if I want to learn how to pray, if I want to be better at praying, I don't need some new system, method, technique. I don't need some vibe. Jesus shows us in the scriptures how to pray. This is why R.C. Sproul said this. I think the greatest weakness in the church today is that almost no one believes that God invests his power in the Bible. Everyone is looking for power in a program, in a methodology, in a technique, in anything and everything but that which God has placed it, his word. He alone has the power to change lives for eternity and that power is focused on the scriptures. Sproul said this in response to our slowness to look to the scriptures, particularly the Lord's instructions on prayer for how we can find help in this area. 
We look for all these helps in lots of different directions, and yet we have the most important thing in front of us, which is the Lord Jesus' instructions. I think one of the things that's happened in our modern, modern age is we become victims of this idea that we have to be spontaneous or inventive in order to be genuine. We've got to be spontaneous. It's got to come from, you know, it's got to kind of be conjured up from within. And it's got to be emotional in order for it to be genuine. But we don't. The Lord's Prayer not only supplies us with words, but it also supplies us with a framework for all of our prayers. And we're going to be looking at that in this series. We're going to talk about what the Lord's Prayer actually looks like broken down. So whether you say the exact words when you pray it, which you should, or whether you're using the framework as you pray it, the Lord's Prayer teaches us how to pray. And it's done by essentially three different sets or two different sets of three within it. Uh, what Jesus does in teaching us to pray is he gives us a set of three of hallowed be your name and your kingdom come and your will be done. That's the first set of three. And that set of three focuses vertically to God. And the next set of three is daily bread, right? Prayer for provision, forgiveness of sins, and deliverance and direction from the evil one and temptation. And these are personal needs. So, so watch, you could summarize the way Jesus teaches us to pray as being one in which we first begin with God's glory and then our good. We, we learn to pray first and foremost for God's glory and then we're praying particularly for our good. Kevin DeYoung notes how significant it is that when the Lord Jesus teaches us how to pray, he never concerns himself with when they were to pray or where they were to pray or how long they were to pray. He focused particularly on what they were to pray. And this is really important for us to understand as well. So today, as we begin this series, we're actually going to start before the Lord's Prayer. We're going to start in, in the prelude of the Lord's Prayer, which you find in verses 5 through 8. And what we're going to see in this lead up to Jesus' framework is two prohibitions and then two promises. Let's look first at these prohibitions. The first thing that we're gonna see is that Jesus strongly prohibits certain things. Look at verse five. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. The first thing that I want you to see, the first prohibition, is don't pray like the hypocrites. Don't pray like the hypocrites. A hypocrite is a word that's used a lot in our world today. People love to call other people hypocrites, right? And especially people who don't go to church love to call people who go to church hypocrites. And our answer is, yeah, we know, right? Nobody lives up to their standard or values or professed beliefs, but that's not necessarily what a hypocrite is. The word hypocrite actually comes from the Greek word hypocrites. And what it meant was an actor. Literally, they called a, hypo, a hypocrite um, somebody who was in stage plays. And back in ancient dramas, both in Greek and Roman dramas, uh, you didn't have different characters playing all the different roles and stories. Often you had just a handful of actors playing all the roles. And what they would do is put the appropriate mask on over themselves as they played the role. Do you know what those people were called, these actors? Hypocrites. Because watch, they were playing a role. They were playing a part. That wasn't really who they were. They were putting on a face. When Jesus says, do not pray like the hypocrites, he's talking about do not be someone who prays to play a part. And particularly what he's saying is don't be somebody who prays for show and consumption in public, but that's not who you really are. Don't be somebody who prays more at the dinner table in public at restaurants than you do privately. Don't be somebody who's quick to pray at small group but who doesn't pray privately. This, he says, is an actor. Someone who's doing it more to be seen by others than in real life. To, to, 
to do devotion to God is not their concern. It's to please and approve and to impress you. That's the difference. Somebody who's saying one thing, but secretly living another thing. It's the vegetarian who goes home and grills steaks to eat every night. Their professed public beliefs are different than their private behaviors. Now compare Jesus here, personally, to the Pharisees. This is actually one of the labels that Jesus gave the Pharisees a lot. He called them hypocrites. He called them actors, people who did a lot of things so that the public thought they were really holy, so that the public thought they were, they were really righteous men. But in reality, they were cold and dead in their hearts. They did everything for show. And so rather than being like a hypocrite, like they were, Jesus wants us to pray in private. Now, this doesn't mean you can't pray publicly, but specifically, if you're gonna be a public prayer, you better be a private prayer. And if you think about the life of Jesus, he modeled this, didn't he? How often did Jesus get away alone to pray? You see it over and over and over in the Gospels. Now, it's important to make some clarity, uh, clarifying remarks here that a hypocrite is not someone who does certain things while feeling a different way. That's a really important distinction. It, attending worship gatherings, even when you don't feel like it, is not hypocrisy. Getting up in the morning and reading your Bible when you'd rather be in the bed is not hypocrisy, that's maturity. That's faithfulness. That's recognizing that some things you need to do even if your heart's not in it. It's not hypocrisy to do that. In fact, when you say, I'm a Christian, I love the Lord Jesus Christ and I wanna follow him, and yet when there's moments where how I feel doesn't align with that, when my actions align with that, I'm not being a hypocrite, I'm being true to my confession. That's why George Mueller said he would often drag his affections kicking and screaming to his Bible reading and prayer time. Come along, fellas, you're going with me even if you don't want to, okay? That is faithfulness, and it's often a sign of maturity. It's when we publicize one set of beliefs but live a different set of beliefs. It's when we say one thing in public and live another that we're being hypocrites. That's hypocrisy. And Jesus says this. He says, the mark of the hypocrites is that they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and the street corners, why do they like to do that for? Why? So they can be seen by others. In other words, they are more concerned, here's the key, with practicing their righteousness before men instead of God. In fact, Jesus says that in Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men. Now, to be clear, this is not a prohibition against praying in public, right? Don't be at small group and somebody asks you to pray and you're like, I don't wanna be a hypocrite. <laughs> Jesus said, don't pray in public. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. It's fine to pray in public. It's just make sure it's not the only time you pray. We're supposed to pray simply to connect and, and to relate to God, not to be seen by others. Don't be a hypocrite. Now, let's look at the second thing, though, that Jesus says, the second prohibition. Verse seven, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard Further many words. The second prohibition that we must guard ourselves against is praying like the pagans, praying like the Gentiles. Jesus warns us against this, and he mentions how the Gentiles pray, not because he's focusing on their ethnicity here. He's not saying don't pray like those ethnic Gentiles. What he's saying is don't pray the way religious Gentiles pray. Religious Gentiles are pagans. Right Now, what does that mean? It means that their devotion and religious beliefs boil down to performing proper actions. They're all about doing the right duties to appease their God or their gods. Do your duty, use the right words, burn the right incense, provide the right sacrifices, visit the right shrines and sites. That is paganism. We're encouraged to pray persistently by the Lord Jesus and don't give up, Luke 18. But there's a huge difference between, watch this, persistent prayer and babbling prayer. The words here, heap up empty phrases, means persistent babbling or vain repetitions. 
you know, sitting there and just saying the same thing over and over again because you think that's the mark of devotion or seriousness. The idea is that the Gentiles don't have relationship to God. For the Gentiles, for pagans, God is impersonal. And so using lots of words and, and demonstrating through different acts and, and you know, demonstrative uh, kind of outbursts is the way they get their God's attention. They think by their many words and their actions, they will get God to move on their behalf. This is why when you look at 1 Kings 18 and Elijah and the prophet of Baal, uh, the prophets of Baal, you see 450 prophets of Baal demonstrating at Mount Carmel by cutting themselves and crying out all day through the, through the, you know, the afternoon because why? He didn't respond, the Baal, Baal didn't respond, but two, they also believed that the more they acted out with their words and physical actions, the more that, that Baal may respond to them. By the way, he didn't. And Elijah, with very few words, called down fire from heaven. You also, if you visit Israel today, will see modern Jews doing this thing as they go to the Western Wall or what is often called the Wailing Wall. And they will sit in front of it for hours and hours and hours and rock and mumble, which is why they call it the Wailing Wall. The sounds of these prayers just being repeated and repeated and repeated. This is what Jesus warns against. Muslims do it today as they pray five times a day facing toward Mecca. No matter where they are, they have to put the rug out and they have to bow down. And There's an order and a ritual to do these things. And Jesus says, you don't have to pray like the pagans. That's not how to approach prayer. But friends, don't think about this being primarily a modern Jew or a Muslim issue. It happens more today than we think with Christians as well. It can happen in a couple different ways, okay? It can happen in churches like ours, if we're not careful, who love to use liturgies and, and uh, call in responses, and, right? If you're not careful, you can let your heart just go into a place of reciting words where, where you're reciting creeds and calls to worship, but your heart's not in it. You're just saying words and prayers and, and nothing else. We gotta guard against that. We can also do it, though, when we're praying from the heart, but we are saying lots of words and phrases, right? The churches and the uh, individuals who are often allergic to liturgies love to often stack up empty phrase on top of empty phrase, and it leads to prayers that get a little sketchy and a little unbiblical theologically. You'll have people say things like, Daddy God, thank you for dying for our sins. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. Daddy God, if you're referring to the Father, did not die for your sins, The son died for your sins. And I could launch into this for a hot minute if I I really felt like getting angry emails. Don't call the father daddy God, okay? First off, would be a great start. Second, we don't just pray all the religious phrases we can think of when we're praying, right? Thank you, Holy Spirit, for raising from the grave makes no biblical sense at all. And so we often can do this same thing, praying like a pagan, heaping empty phrase on top of empty phrase if we're not careful. God will hear us if we just freestyle it and get really emotional in our prayers. John Stott had a phrase for this. He called it all lips, no mind, and no heart. All lips, no mind, and no heart. And this is exactly what Jesus is warning about. He says, don't do that. So these two prohibitions by Jesus, before he even shows us how to pray, is don't pray like the hypocrites. Doing it in public, while in private you neglect prayer. Doing it so others can think you're holy, while actually failing to approach a holy God. Don't do like that. But also beware of being like the pagans who just like to say lots of words and they think if they can be demonstrative and emotional and just say lots of things, oh dear heavenly father, God of hosts, holy armies of angels, we thank you. And God's going, why are you doing that? Right? Why, why are you talking like that? If you're not talking like that every, everywhere else in your life, why are you all of a sudden dressing up all of your language and flowery spiritual talk? Jesus says, you don't have to pray like that. Don't pray like the pagans, heaping up lots of words and phrases. Now here's what Jesus then does. 
With each prohibition, he then gives a promise associated with it to counteract your temptation to do that. But before we get into those prohibitions, let me just ask you this kind of heart-searching question. Which of those ditches are you most prone to fall into? Which of these prohibitions would you say is the easiest for you to become guilty of? To be the hypocrite or to be the pagan? To be the actor or to be the one that heaps up empty, vain repetition and phrases because you think that's what's pleasing to God? Now here's the prohibition or the, the promises that accompany these prohibitions. The first one you'll find going back to verse six. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. The first promise is that your father sees in secret and will reward This is a counter to the person who's the hypocrite who only prays in public. He says, rather than being uh, praying to be seen by others, Jesus says, go into your room, go into private and shut the door and pray to your father who sees in secret. And this is the promise as you go to that secret place, that, that quiet place to pray, your father sees and hears you. He sees and hears you. And then he says, and will reward you. You don't have to pretend and put on religious garments and, 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 and pretension. You don't need to put on the religious mask and add flowery language to it. You don't need to do it in such a way that would impress anyone outside of that prayer closet. Your goal in this moment is to go to your father and pray with all your heart. And to recognize this, you do not need to fear punishment as you come. You're not approaching a judge, but a father. And he sees you. And he will, watch this, reward those who come. Your devotion may be concealed from the eyes of men, but it is not concealed from the eyes of God. And you know what it requires to do this, friends? Faith. Faith that God hears us when we come. Faith that God sees us when we come. Faith that God rewards us when we come. And how does he reward? How does he reward? Well, Jesus doesn't spell it out because the reward is he answers your prayers. He answers your prayers. We pray in private and he rewards in public. You know, many of the things and blessings you see of God in people's lives publicly are because of their prayers privately. He rewards those who come to him in prayer. So don't live for earthly applause or to be considered impressive by men. Seek the smile of your heavenly father who sees in secret. One of the things that the Puritans often would encourage, this wasn't that movie, or was it the prayer room, or was it the prayer room movie? Is it, did I just make that name up? Uh, there was a movie about going to a prayer closet, right? And it talked about the power of, uh, of having a place to go and petition the Lord and do war, war room, that was it. I'd get there, just give me a second. And... Um, you know, a lot of people who are deeper theologically kind of, you know, like, meh, on that idea. You know, it's kind of cheesy. Uh, the Puritans actually believed that it, it was important to have a, a place where you went to pray in secret. Uh, in fact, they get it from the idea that in most Jewish homes, they would have a room, uh, usually a place on the rooftop where it was flat, c- away from everyone else in the home, which is why oftentimes when the disciples gathered, they were gathered in what? The upper room. And and a lot of people believe that when Jesus is talking about go to the place in secret, that there was actually a place that was secluded where people could go and pray without everybody looking and knowing that they were were praying. They weren't practicing their righteousness before men. So maybe a question for you would be this. Do Do you have a place that you can go in secret? I mean, yes, you go to the Lord in your heart, 
But there is a power. There is something behind our physical posture and location when we pray. Getting on your knees does something a little different than just, you know, standing and praying with your eyes open. It's all praying if your heart's engaged, but there is something that comes along with our physical posture. And, and, and I think the Puritans were onto something with having a place where we go and we know we're there to meet with God. Your father sees in secret and will reward you. Here's the second promise that is given. The second promise is in verse eight. Do not be like them, the pagans, the Gentiles. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. The second promise that we have is your father knows what you need before you ask. This is one of the most incredible promises in all of scripture. Because you are in Christ and God is now your father, you can approach the throne knowing you are heard. But watch this, even more so, you can know that the father knows what you need before you ask. And here's why that matters. That means you don't have to go on and on and on about your needs. You don't have to watch, heap up a bunch of phrases. You don't have to keep going and going because he already knows what you need before you come. And he doesn't know this simply because he's omniscient over all things in the world. He doesn't purely know it because of his omniscience. He has particular knowledge of you. He has particular knowledge of you. He knows you. He loves you. So watch, your praying to him is not informing him of your needs. It's not even asking him for intervention about a situation he doesn't know about and you're catching him up to speed. He doesn't need help running the universe. We're also not seeking to change his mind when we come to him in prayer. Rather, we pray despite him knowing what we need. We pray because God has arranged the world to work that way. He uses prayers as a means to bring about his ends. Do you, know, you, you understand what I'm saying? God uses our prayers to bring about those ends that he intends to bring about. He doesn't need them, but he uses them. He ordains the means just like he ordains the ends. Think about this. He has ordained that the means of hard labor and diligent labor and wisdom will bring prosperity in your life. He has ordained that the means of rain and tilling the ground and sunshine will bring a crop, an end of a produce and a a crop that will bear fruit. These are means that God has supplied for his ends. All of them are means to ends. And prayer is the same thing as well. Prayer is used of God to bring about his sovereign plans. So we're not to pray like a hypocrite for public consumption alone. And we're not to pray like a pagan who heaps up lots of empty words as if our God doesn't know what we need before we even ask him. Instead, we're to pray in the way that Jesus is going to instruct us as we go into next week. But it's so important that we understand both these prohibitions and promises as we begin to think about our own prayer lives. We don't, we don't wanna pray like those who do it only for, the, for show. We wanna be those who go in secret regularly. May God begin to birth this desire to pray in secret in you. And and we don't want to be people who just babble when we get in there, who are just not even thinking. We're just mindlessly saying words. But rather, we remember that the God who, who we pray to is the God present in that secret place, and he knows what we need before we even approached him. And yet, Jesus still says, pray like this. We're still called to pray, even though he knows what we need. Now, here's how I want to close And I don't think there could be a better way to close this message because there's something astonishing just kind of weaved in this entire text, even the text that we looked at particularly this morning, that maybe you just blew past, maybe you didn't even catch it, maybe it didn't even register to you, but it's incredibly profound. In fact, the whole storyline of the Bible is leading to this reality, and it's this. When Jesus teaches us how to pray, he tells us to address God Almighty as Father as father, the God who created the universe, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who brought plagues and parted the Red Sea, the God who gave victory to Joshua and the armies of Israel, the God who is over all the nations and who saves and spares the three Hebrew boys in the flaming furnace in front of Nebuchadnezzar. That God, 
That God, the God you read about in the pages of the word invites you to call him father. Not judge. Not just creator. But father. And this is vital to understand. To pray to the God of the universe with this kind of intimacy and this kind of familial closeness is not a human right. It's a spiritual privilege. It's not a human right to call God Father. People in our world like today say, well, you know, everybody's God's children. It's like, well, everybody is created by God. And in maybe that sense, children. But the scriptures say there are two groups of people. First John says, you are either a child of God or a child of the devil. We are born into sin. We must be born again into the kingdom of God. We are sinners who are orphaned and estranged. And we need to be reconciled and redeemed. And that's what Christ has done for us. It's a spiritual privilege to call God Father and it comes to only those who are in Christ. This is why Jesus and Jesus alone can tell his disciples then and his disciples now, pray like this, Father. Address God the way I address him as Father. Because it's through Jesus' perfectly righteous life imputed to you. And through his sacrificial death atoning for your sins and removing them as far as the east is from the west that he has made us children of God. And only disciples of Jesus get to call God Father. Now two quick things on this. First off, when we pray to God the Father in our prayer, it is a collective work of the Trinity that's going on. So don't feel like, well, what about Jesus? Or what about the Holy Spirit? Romans 8 tells us that the Spirit of God enables us to cry what? Abba, Father. And not only does the Spirit enable us to cry Abba, Father, it is by the Spirit that we are children of God, heirs of God, and called fellow heirs with who? With Christ. With Christ. So all who pray the Lord's Prayer from the heart are demonstrating the work of the Trinity in allowing us to call God Father. Now here's the second address, and I'm not being funny or cute, but the address of God as Father is not to be substituted with Mother. It's not to be substituted with Mother. And this isn't because God is male rather than female, but because this is how God has chosen to reveal himself with masculine pronouns. And this is how we are commanded to address him as father, him, his, he, not she, not her, not mother. I was at a college graduation, a university graduation once, and the person who was doing the uh, invocation, the prayer, got up and said, Mother God. And I just thought, well, I'm out of here. We're not, um, we're, we're, not, we're not praying to the same God here. Um, it's not happening. It doesn't matter what our world thinks is appropriate or more in step with the times. We address God as he has instructed us to address him. So at the end of the day, what I hope you'll see from this, this next three weeks is that prayer is about relationship with the creator of the universe. And the heart of prayer is about recognizing who God is. He's not hard of hearing. And he's also not hard of heart. You can speak to God as you are, not with religious colored language to impress him, but as your heavenly father. The key to prayer is a heart willing to simply show up and talk to God. Let me say that again, because if you leave with nothing else, I hope you hear this. The heart of prayer is a heart willing to simply show up and talk to God. And the scriptures tell us, which we must believe by faith, he hears us and he's eager to hear them. May God raise up in us a greater desire to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We pray that today would bring glory to you and would magnify the goodness of your grace through Christ that we are welcomed and invited to know you and to come to you in prayer what a privilege it is as more and more of us live like that Lord it is undoubtedly going to 
display the glory of who you are in the world around us. Men and women who are living to honor the king and his kingdom, to align our lives with your word and to live according to your will, Lord, we want this to be what our prayer lives form in us. And so we ask that you do it, Lord. You know what each of us needed as we showed up today. You know whether we pray like pagans or hypocrites. And so we pray that you would meet our needs. Show us today how it is to pray. Forgive us for the ways in which we are hypocrites or pray like pagans. And help us not to judge others who struggle in this life to pray. Lord, help us to be sympathetic because of our own struggles. Lord, we know the enemy would love to keep each of us from praying. And we know the temptation that we face every day is to rush through our day to the next thing, to the next thing, without stopping to bring our needs to you. And without relying on you to help meet those needs, Lord. So we pray that you would lead us away from this temptation of self-reliance and self-dependence. And help us to wage war against the evil one, Lord, by our willingness to pray. We love you, Jesus. We thank you that through you and in you, we can call God Father. I pray that those who do not know God as Father today would hear that call and would have their sins forgiven and respond to him in grace. We pray this, Jesus, in your great name. Amen.